proceed. Uh, <coughs> is this reasonably clear? That uh, the need to use some kind of uh, taxation to to handle this uh, this um, emission issue is kind of uh, it's. I would say. When you talk about international transportation, it's kind of urgent to, to, to do something about it because it affects the primary effect is, is the, the use of, uh, of transportation as it is now. But, this, uh, but the more long term effect has to do with the, with the global division of labor. I just I cannot resist the temptation to show you another. Uh, thing here. Have you seen it yeah. before? Yep. This is a long-term perspective on global war warming. It's even before I was born, 400,000 years ago. <laughs> it's uh, based on, uh, on uh <coughs> an analysis of, uh, of samples from a, f from a glacier or a number of glaciers, because uh, the big glaciers, they, they hide quite a lot of information when it comes to temperature changes over a very long period of time. And this uh, is kind of sawtooth pattern is kind of interesting. It tends to repeat itself. And this is for 1950, which is, even that is before I was born. Then they are here. If we zoom into the last, let's say, this is the last 10,000 years. This is then uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is the time from, say, 1750 and up to today. So there is a sharp, very sharp increase. And this is uh, <coughs> what worries uh, quite a lot of, of people. At the same time, there are determinists around saying that, well, it doesn't matter because it will, it will happen anyway that you get the peak in CO2 concentration. And then <coughs> suddenly things will start to, to go towards a colder climate again. And this is the temperature temperature change. This is the CO2 concentration. And this is the temperature change, which you see that that happens quite quite abruptly that it it goes down quite 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 suddenly. And some uh, <coughs> climate researchers they, they say that well this is due to that uh, that the Gulf Stream, which we benefit from here uh is driven by a certain mechanism up in the in the arctic sea and if the water gets warm enough this this current the gulf current will stop and if that happens <coughs> it will be very very cold in uh, in parts in the northern hemisphere, at least here in uh, in Norway and and in Europe in general. So, the suspicion is that the reason behind the sudden drop in in global temperature has to do with that. And we are approaching, at least historically, the the level of CO two concentration where things are can be expected to happen. And in, in this respect, to discuss carbon taxes is it? well. <coughs> it depends on your viewpoints. My uh, <coughs> one one viewpoint might be that no matter what will happen, you should try to use the the resources uh, efficiently and try to avoid damages. As a, you might have that as a philosophical standpoint. This, regardless of the rather deterministic sawtooth pattern that you, you saw on the on the previous slide, 
that is the point of departure for for us uh, anyway now on to a bit more perhaps pleasant topic this is vessel energy and efficiency <coughs> uh, on average, and this now we are talking about uh, about ships. Uh, this is uh, fuel consumption in kilos per ton nautic mile. Ton nautic mile, uh, which is a which is a, a production measure. And uh, <coughs> CO two is uh, is following the. Uh, fuel consumption in a, a kind of a fixed rate because one kilo of fuel consumption causes 3.17 kilos of CO2 to be emitted to the atmosphere so the the, the link is 1 to 3.17 and this is a bit confusing because and it confused me as well when I read this the first time but it, it depends on the scaling here. Because this is the scale for CO2, and this is the scale for fuel consumption. So you should note that when you read the article. And, and the article, which is uh, the Sea Transport Green Label at, uh, at Risk, <coughs> this is taken from, uh, discusses this. So, so you, you, you will understand that when you read it. And there is a certain, <coughs> certain mistake which, uh, which I discovered yesterday, that uh, the CO2 should be teragram per 100 ton nautic mile. Because CO2 is, is only normally only a fraction of the CO2 emissions. SO2 is normally only a fraction of the CO2, of the CO2 emissions. Which makes sense when you correct that to 100 ton miles instead of just ton miles. Terra means billion or milliard in Norwegian. Giga is million, Terra is billion, Mega is thousand. But you don't care about that. Uh, the point is that uh, there, there is a cert certain positive development. It has, this was due to the oil crisis that I showed you in the 70s, that you had this increase in, in efficiency. And at the same time, there was a, a lot of old ships, which was replaced by newer ships around 1980. But after that, the pace of renewal has sort of, it has been there, but not a very strong uh, trend. And the technological development since then, on um, when it comes to, to machinery, has not been very, very kind of sort of impressive. It's, um, it's interesting because within the road transport sector, as I mentioned, the authorities has been very active in setting standards. You have heard about the Euro 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, now we are on Euro 6 class of, uh, of uh, truck engines with demands for, uh, for reduced emissions and energy use all the time. Whereas for ships, the <coughs> we have the MARPOL convention, which will uh, will uh, will come into effect uh, when, for instance, when it comes to sulfur, it will come into effect from 2015 on, and that is a standard which regulates uh, regulates emissions, and there will also be regulations connected to energy efficiency in ships. So. One tries now to implement some of the same thinking in sea transport, to regulate by setting standards, and hence force old ships to be phased out, and also force a kind of, uh, of uh, or initiate a kind of technological development when it comes to machinery. <coughs> this is. Uh, when we are trying to approach the problem, the research problem in these cases that we are going to discuss is what type of transport is most energy efficient from A to B. To, to, to transport a given amount of cargo from A to B. That is a very simple question. And then we, we need to, <coughs> to address 
the carbon impact for, from different types of, uh, of transportation, CO2 in grams emitted per metric ton of freight per kilometer of transportation, as shown here. Um, I need just to tell you one thing. You should be very critic about the sources for this type of information. Because there is so many dodgy uh, consultancy reports and policy documents around which actually give wrong numbers. And they tend to be very optimistic <coughs> on, on behalf of the ships because this, uh, the, the shipping sector has been quite active here. Uh, and <coughs> they may also tend to be overly optimistic when it comes to air transport. I mean, if you read the magazines on board the, the aircraft, especially the carrier Norwegian, they are sort of the, <laughs> the winners when it comes to, let's say, greenwashing air transport. Uh, if you read the magazines on the pocket on the back of the seats there, you can get some, some numbers. So we need to be critical when addressing the sources. And uh, <coughs> when we did this study, which was finalized yesterday on, on Geiranger, we used multiple sources to try to work out differences and try to, uh, to, to really uh, calculate a lower and upper bound based on different sources. So <coughs> this is a kind of a uh, this is quite tidy because they 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 just give an interval maximum minimum somewhere in this area the truth the truth is hopefully uh, uh, lying down. Here we see this thing that I talked about the trucks. And the uh, and the standards, and uh, and the different euro classes. Uh, I haven't, or uh, this source Harald Dielle hasn't uh, updated it with Euro six, which is uh, which is even lower. But we see here that the NOx uh, has been uh, reduced quite a lot. A certain amount of reduction in CO two as well, as the engines have been become more fuel efficient. But, but NOx has been reduced, partly due to installation of catalytic converters um, and so on. But, but the NOx is, uh, is important because, because of this. It uh, causes, in eventually, when as, as it works its way through the atmosphere, it causes some very aggressive greenhouse gases. Ozone and uh, methane is, is, is highly aggressive. So it has been considered as, as very important. And also, one has to sort of also have that in mind, that it is relatively easy technologically to get rid of NOx. It's much harder to get rid of uh, CO2 because it's so closely linked with with the, the use of, uh, of fossil fuels. But this is not, it has not been a result of uh, any kind of, let's say, laissez-faire natural, natural development. It has been a result of setting standards. And it's easier here because you replace, let's say, a heavy goods vehicle, the, the truck, is replaced on average every four years. So it's relatively easy to implement new, new, tech new engine technology there. Then <coughs> on to the cases. Uh, the first one is a road pack services, service going between Trondheim and Paris. Row packs means that uh, the vessel can take uh, 
heavy goods vehicles as well as passengers. You can translate that to, uh, to a ship like this, which is, a, which is a big car ferry going, for instance, between Oslo and Copenhagen. You can translate it to a, to a fast ferry going between uh, the southern part of Norway, Kristiansand and Hitchhals, which is uh, it's, it's much faster and hence it consumes a lot more energy. I'll come back to that. Show you show you the relationship a bit later on, or it may be a <coughs> it may be a, a ferry service with a optimized where you try to optimize everything by, for instance, introducing a longer hull. Um, this is not the course in uh, in ship design, but but a longer hull uh, may uh, entail a certain reduction in uh, in in fuel consumption. Whereas a short and wide hull, as opposed to a narrower and longer one, a short and wide one, will consume more, more fuel per produced unit. So you can achieve something by looking into ship design as well. So we try to run uh, five cases which are which are realistic based on uh, different transport ways of transporting the the, the, the cargo but uh, and, and some of these are not actually in service they have been planned to put them into service like this one which goes from uh, Christian Sund which is uh, Quite close to Molde, Molde is here, and then on to to Rosyth in in uh, in Scotland, and then further on to uh, to uh, to the continent, with a optimized ferry concept with a long narrower hull, and you have <coughs> another. Well, I think I'll go this take it case by case here. Road and medium ferry is this one, which is then uh, a uh, truck service to, uh, to, uh, to Larvik here, and a ferry to, to Fredrikshavn in, in, in Denmark, and then um, a service, truck service to Paris. Case two is then the, the trucking to Kristiansund, and then optimized ferry to Rosset, and then to the continent, and then on to Paris by road. Case 3 <coughs> is, uh, is a long optimized, uh, this, this uh, optimized ferry to, to the same place, Rosset, and then trucking through the UK and then a short ferry connection on to, to the continent. Case 4 is road all the way th through Sweden and Denmark and then on to, to Paris. And the fifth one is, is then road to Kristiansand and the fast ferry to Denmark, to Hitchhals, and then the road. So there is a, is a mix of, of cases. All of them are, are, are quite realistic. The less, the least realistic is, is these two, because um, there is something with the amount of cargo that is available in, in real life, because Trondheim is, is not a very big city, whereas the, the cargo hub in Norway is here at uh, near Oslo, and where most people live here, so it's easier to imagine that these three cases are, are realistic, and actually they are real life cases. They are in operation as we speak, so to speak. But uh, the data is available, so it's possible to, to calculate all five cases. Then <coughs> how do we do this in, uh, in, uh, in practice? We need to structure the problem. And we need, we need the vessel specifications 
Uh, for these, we have now three vessel types, a high-speed ferry, a conventional car ferry, and these long optimized, uh, long narrow optimized ferries. And uh, for each of these uh, types, we need to get hold of data for engines, engine size and types. ME is main engine, and AE is auxiliary engine. Auxiliary engines in Norwegian is hjelpmotor. And as I said, on certain types of ships, the auxiliary engines are actually quite large and, uh, and, uh, and fuel-consuming uh, for, for the cruise ships. Uh, for, a, for a bulk ship, it's, uh, it's much, uh, much smaller. And then the main engine is the it's a really main source of consumption. Operating speed. <coughs> Operating speed is highly important. Because that is the real significant variable which with a given technology and a given ship where you can influence the fuel consumption. Because if you slow steam, if you if you if you run at a speed lower than the than the service speed of the of the ship, you can save a lot of fuel. And I'll show you. I'll show you uh, a slide in a in a few minutes, indicating that. Energy use <coughs> closely related with operating speed, as I'll show you, and also you could include pre-chain energy use. That means uh, energy connected to the production of the ship, uh, port operations, and so on. Average workload is another variable, which is important to, to uh, is, uh, which you can actually influence in a very short run by trying to consolidate cargo to increase the workload, avoid ha a half empty ship running, and you need a lot of uh, you need a quite a lot of cargo to fill a ship uh, in practice, which makes it hard to have a very intensive type of direct cargo service. Let's say from a small city or like Molde and down to the European continent, there is a liner service going here. I think it calls here. I'm, I'm not exactly, I don't know exactly how many times a week, but it's quite frequent, which calls on, on uh, a lot of ports along the coastline to, to be able to have a, a decent workload. Fuel quality, that has to do with whether you run it on heavy marine diesel, heavy marine oil, or ordinary diesel. LNG is coming, liquid natural gas, which solves some problems connected to NOx and particles, and a bit CO2. Uh, emission factors, then we are talking about CO2, NOx, SO2 particles, and maybe also volatile organic components in addition to that and the cargo capacity. <coughs> and that is cargo capacity and with this specific type of ships, which can carry both passengers and cargo. We are op operating with uh, LM, which is lane meters, as an indication of, of cargo carrying capacity. <laughs> uh, which is actually the number of meters that can be used for uh, for uh, for transporting uh, trucks, heavy goods vehicles. So these are <coughs> these are data on on uh, on uh, on the ship, and then on the case. These are sources used for this article, which you have as part of your readings. You need distances, transport distances. Which is uh, which can be different between sea and land, as you saw from the map. 
there are differences here. And this is important. And that is important in the comparison. Because you could imagine that a more straight line, shorter distance, with a, let's say, less energy efficient way of, of transporting the cargo, could be the winner anyway, if it is, uh, if it is um, shorter as compared to a more with a, with a longer stretch. Load factors per leg, and the leg is the stretch between two ports. So we need to have a kind of an, uh, the load factor is a very important uh, part of this to, to be able to address uh, the efficiency and to be able to address whether you can change the load factor to be able to be more efficient. Average speed, which again, <coughs> a lower average speed um, or a higher average speed will have substantial effects on, on, uh, on fuel consumption. And then terminal handling time, which, which is uh, not the main issue in a, in a comparison of, uh, of uh, energy efficiency. So this is for ships. <coughs> and then you have the same for road transport. Road transport is kind of easier because it's it's uh, it's more transparent and more reliable sources for uh, for energy consumption on road transport. Uh, an HGV consumes in the area of four to five liters per, per uh, ten kilometers. Uh, the cargo capacity is given. Space requirement is uh, is straightforward, more or less standard length of those vehicles or standard classes. And the load factors can be the only uncertain factor because it's not that easy to get hold of such data for the HGVs as well. I know that because I've tried to get hold of that information. You can observe a vehicle. You can see that it carries, uh, say, a couple of 20-foot equivalent units, containers. But you you it's very hard to get information about what is inside and how much does it weigh here. But this is used to compare ship with road, different ship classes with, with road transport, and, and to, to derive then the, the, to calculate the differences. Let's say now, if we have, or uh, just before uh, we, we quit this, I'll just want to show you this one. This is an illustration showing the disadvantages of speed with respect to fuel consumption, or vice versa, the advantages of slow steaming. This is uh, <coughs> power outtake, or uh, speed with respect to speed as a percentage of maximum speed. Um, and this is fuel consumption. So we see that if you have a, an operating speed or as, uh, as 60%, 60% of the, of the maximum full steam ahead speed. Let's say if you run a bulk vessel at uh, six knots instead of 10, which may be the maximum, you only consume, you only use 10% or 11, 12% of the engine outtake. If you go at 90%, you use little less than 60%. So it's, it's, a, it's an exponential function here with the power of three. So the change in speed in percent powered by three gives you the, the change in fuel consumption. So if we get a change in <coughs> speed of 20%, 1.2, if you take 1.2, power it by 3, you get the resulting increase in fuel consumption. 
So this is actually <coughs> this is uh, designed for a I think it's for a medium-sized uh, Roro uh, ship, but the uh, so there may be certain variances here with respect to ship types, but the the relationship is fairly equal between ship types. When you increase the service speed, you have a very sharp increase in the uh, in the engine power out outtake. Of course, at the maximum you have 100 percent, and the fuel consumption is following. So <coughs> let's say if you have a, a ship with a, let's say a big um, Roro ship with uh, engine power of 20,000 kilowatts. I can just add that one horsepower is, is uh, equal to or the number of of horsepowers is equal to the number of kilowatt divided by 0 0.734 for those who are interested in that. So the number of kilowatts is always lower than the number of horsepowers. <coughs> we have a service speed uh, 50 knots. Let's say uh, that is, uh, for simplicity, 100% of so 15 knots. And then we can uh, sail at. Uh, Let's say an operating speed of um, 10 knots. And that should be around 67% outtake. Should be then, according to that illustration, around 10%. Not much. It is 2,000 kilowatt. First step, <coughs> and then fuel consumption. And that is a, there, are, there is a certain interval, but you could consider it to be around 0 0.2 kilograms per kilowatt per hour. So if you run an engine per hour, service and operating so the service speed is uh, with a hundred percent outtake you can easily con calculate that to be around four thousand kilos Operating, not much, 400. So this is a comparison <coughs> of uh, two speed scenarios. And if you then consider CO2 emissions, that is also fixed ratio of 
or it varies slightly between different fuel types. And I'm not now excluding electricity and, uh, and LNG, liquid natural gas, but for diesel or marine, heavy marine fuel, uh, <coughs> gives three point in the area of 3.2 kilogram CO2. And then you can say per hour service and operating. You can just multiply 400 4,000 times 3.2 and 400 times 3.2, which is in the area of some kilos. And you have <coughs> by using an illustration like that, you can. Uh, have an operating speed somewhere in between. Let's say you just reduce it to 13 knots. You can calculate the percentage outtake easily and then do, do the calculations all over again. So this is per ship. And then <coughs> you need to, if you are now going to address a specific freight operation, you need to include then um, load factors and so on. I'll come back to that a bit later on. But this is just to calculate, let's say, easily emissions, fuel consumption per hour of a given ship operation run by two different speeds. So it's just to get hold of the data, which is the hard part. The calculations are, uh, are, are quite easy, and uh, they are detailed out in the, in the um, paper as well. So here <coughs> you have, let's say, the setup of the calculations. And uh, I think I will uh, spend some time on that illustration, which gives a good time to break, I think. So we commence within 15 minutes. <coughs> 